Father, we just pray right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Thank you so much for the ability that we have just to come and stand before you. Thank you, Lord, that our dance team was able to minister and worship, Father God. I thank you for how it touched our hearts, our lives, how it just reached down and just, you know, gave us some hope, Lord, and just to enjoy the things that they were doing. Father, thank you so much. For today, as I'm going to bless the food, Lord, as we go down to celebrate Thanksgiving, Lord. Let us be reminded of everything that we are thankful for, especially your extravagant love. And we pray over the offering, Lord. Thank you for pressing down, shaking together, and letting our vats overflow. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. So how's everybody this morning? Worship was amazing. Um, so I always try to keep um, a couple of two or three sermons ready just in case. And I had some uh, sermon ready to talk about the characters and people in the Bible. And as I was praying late last night and early this morning, I just really felt like it was uh, a little shift happening. So I decided to switch it up this morning. So this morning, if you will, turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And now seeing what we went through with worship and then dance, it makes perfect sense why the Lord would have me switch it. First Corinthians chapter 13, many of you know, many of you have read or even studied, um, it's the love chapter. So we're going to talk about God's amazing love this morning. And how many of you know what it's like to be loved? How many know what it's like to be loved? How many have loved someone? There's no greater feeling in this world than to be loved by someone who absolutely loves you for you, no matter what you've done or where you've gone. It's an amazing feeling. And I want to say with that type of love, that when you look at how Jesus loves, it's extravagant. It's wild. Why would he love somebody like me? Who every reason why I shouldn't even be alive, he still reached down and loves me. And not only me, but he loves you. He loves everything about you. He loves you so much that all the things that you call flaws, he created. Your height, your lack of height, <laughs> your size, he created that because he loves you. He loves you, and he says you are fearfully and wonderfully made. So if you look at how God loves you, and you know that he loves you, and you believe that God is perfect, and you start looking at your flaws and how you're created, and you don't like it, what you're saying is God made a mistake. And I don't believe God ever makes mistakes. He knew you. He formed you. He fashioned you. He is the potter, and we are the clay. And the way he made you, he made you for a purpose and for a reason because of the way he loves. So turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 13. And follow along, and I'm going to read some scripture. 1 Corinthians 13, the greatest gift. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient and is kind. It does not envy. It does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, Love never fails. So when I'm reading and I'm studying and I'm looking at love, um, in the Greek, in the New Testament, there's a lots of different uh, examples of love, but predominantly the Apostle Paul in the New Testament talks about three types of love. Eros love, which is, the, which is erotic love. It's, it's lovers, it's passion, it's romantic. There's uh, phileo love, which is friendship. Uh, pals, clothes, brotherly love, and then there's agape love, which is sacrificial. And so give some examples. My brother Daryl, I love him with phileo love. I am not romantically in love with Daryl, okay? 
He is my brother. We are brothers. We phileo each other. You know what I'm saying? Jesus agapes us. Agape is a sacrificial love. When you sacrifice things for people you love, it's called agape. And there's some verses that kind of goes with that. Um, the word Paul uses uh, is agape, which is in 1 Corinthians 13, which is the love that sacrifices for the good of others. Love that sacrifices for the good of others. When is the last time you have agape somebody? When is the last time that you have sacrificed something in your life for somebody else? We oftentimes fail in that area of our life. We talk about love. We throw love, the word love around and put hearts on everything like it really means something. Does it mean anything anymore? Because oftentimes what I've found in my life is that love is conditional. Love is conditional. If you vote the way I vote, I will love you. If you believe what I believe in the Bible, I will love you. If you dress like I want you to dress, if you agree with everything I tell you to agree with, I will love you. But the moment you don't do what I think you should do, my love for you stops because it's conditional. I don't like being loved with conditional love because I can never live up to those expectations. I can never live up to the standards that y'all have set for me or that I have set for you because I will fail you. You will fail me. But there is a love, church, that will never fail. And it's Jesus. And I can assure you, I have failed him more times than I want to count. And the fact that he could look down and say, Tim, you failed me, but I love you. And I always go back to the prodigal son, where the son that left the dad, he was still the son of the father. And just because we get away from God, or we lose our way, or we get tripped up, or we get caught up in something, that doesn't mean God stops loving us. It just means we're separated from him, but he is still there. And when the kid came back to his dad, he was, the dad just ran out to him. And he said, I love you. And he said it by the actions. Put a robe on him. Put sandals on his feet. Put a ring on his finger. Restored him back to 100% of being his son. And we get away from God's love. And then we look at other people and we put conditions on it. Do we truly love each other? Do we love our spouse? And you look at your kids. Do they do everything you want them to do? No. I can assure you, mine don't. I pray hard for my son to take a bath every night, and I still love him when he doesn't, even though I have to wash his sheets, and his fingers are black, but he plays hard, and he expects me to love him. I expect Jesus to love me. I expect my God, without fail, to love me with agape love, so much agape love that when you look at, at the crucifixion, three times Peter was standing there and the woman standing at the fire, they said, hey, weren't you one of his disciples? Peter said, no, I wasn't. They'll so ask him again, weren't you with Jesus? He said, no. And they'll say, well, your actions and your voice failed you. Were you with him? And he says, I do not know the man. He denied Jesus three times. And the reason he denied Jesus because the disciples fully expected Jesus to set up an earthly kingdom and overthrow the Roman government. They were still thinking with their worldly eyes and not their spiritual eyes. It wasn't until after the resurrection when Jesus came back. Our whole faith is, is hinged around the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our whole faith is hinged around the empty tomb. So when, they, when he appeared to Jesus, when Jesus appeared to Peter, he said, Peter, do you love me? Peter replied, I phileo you. He said, yeah, you're a friend. Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? He said, yeah, I phileo you. And Jesus asked him a third time, Peter, do you love me? And this is where it changed. Peter said, Lord, you know all things. I agape you. He changed 
He recognized this is Jesus. His love for Jesus means that now I'm going to sacrifice for you, Jesus, because I love you so much. Peter says, I agape you, which is sacrificial love. And when you study and you read in Josephus and you read about how P uh, Peter was crucified and requested to be crucified upside down, he loved Jesus so much he didn't feel like he could die a death worthy of being outstretched like this. He has to do it upside down. And he gave his life as a martyr for Jesus. How do you love Jesus this morning? How do you love the man that sacrificed everything? You know what I love about Jesus? Is that his love for me wasn't conditional on my love for him because I fail. I will fail him. And no matter what, in all my sin, basking in all my unrighteousness, he said, I love you. He says, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. I am yours and you are mine. That is unconditional love. That no matter what happens, he's gonna love me. He says in John 3, 16, for God so agape us, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God agapes us so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish. That whosoever encompasses everyone regardless of who you vote or your political affiliation, regardless of the color of your skin, regardless of what side of the tracks you grow up on, that whosoever is me, that whosoever is you, there was no strings attached. But don't we love opposite of that? Don't we love with conditional love? Don't we love Jesus sometimes with conditional love that when he's given us what we pray for and ask him, we're all fired up, praising God, name it, claim it, blab it and grab it. I'm, I'm blessed and highly favored. But when he says no, we start questioning. Oh, does God really love me? Am I the only one that does that? I guess so. And then he says in John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this than to lay his life down for his friends. I'm gonna ask you, church, serious question. Serious question. When is the last time you have given your life for your friends? When is the last time you loved somebody so much that you went out of your way, that you fed your enemies, that you blessed them even though they cursed you, that you said, you know what? We can agree to disagree and I'm still gonna love you. When is the last time that you laid down your life for your friend? And when sometimes we have to look past the hurts that's happened to us. I've had to come to full circle with that dealing with my father my biological father, I've questioned and questioned why doesn't he love me? Why won't he be part of my life? How come he always is, has everything and he can do everything for everyone but me? I said, why? And I've had to say, Lord, forgive me. Whether he deserves it or not, I need the forgiveness for me so I don't walk with bitterness, so I'm not filled with anger, so I'm not filled with rage. Does he deserve it? God says he does. But I ask God to forgive me and help me to love. When's the last time you've looked past that hurt or something that your spouse may have done or something that your child may have done where they've used you and maybe they stole your money or they stole your car. When have you looked past the love and said it doesn't matter, you're mine and I am yours? I had a guy asked me one time at work, he said, Pastor Tim, sometimes they would call me Pastor Tim in a, in a way to mock me, but I was okay with that. He said, Pastor Tim, what are you gonna do when your daughter shows up and says, hey daddy, I'm gay? And I said, well, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say is my responsibility? He says, I'm to love my neighbor as myself. 
Is that clear? Do I need to say it louder for the people in the back? I love my neighbor as myself, which is the greatest commandment. I'm going to love my daughter, I'm going to love my son, I'm going to love my neighbor, regardless of their sexual orientation, regardless of their political affiliation, I'm going to love, because that is my commandment, first to love, and God can work everything out. I am not a judge, I don't want to be a judge, I don't want to point at you and say you're wrong, I'm going to speak the truth, and God is going to bring conviction where conviction needs to be brought, because I love How can we win people for the gospel if we can't love people different than us? How can I tell somebody the extravagant love of Jesus when I'm looking down my face, judging them because of the things they're living and the lifestyle they're living? Need I remind us of our past, where we were broken, where we were lost. We didn't have nothing, living in sin, extravagant sin. I was the poster child for sin. I promise you, some of you knew that. And you know, and you're smiling, because you know. And his love reached down, said, I love you. My love for you, he says, is not conditioned on anything you do or anything you say. If you were the only one here, if you're the only one on this earth, I would have still sent my son to die for you. That's pretty deep. That's pretty deep. The greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. And I would have to say, as a whole, in this nation, we are missing the mark on loving our neighbor as ourself. We are missing the mark on loving people who look different than us. When I went on outreach, a lot of the, you saw the video, a lot of the video of the people I was talking to that was under the bridge, I edited out um, just because some of the words that were said, you know, and some of the things that they were struggling with that I didn't feel like needed to be public knowledge. And one of the things that was mentioned the most was that they feel forgotten. They feel like nobody cares for them. They feel like nobody loves them because of the choices, because of the lifestyle they live, because of the clothes they wear, even because of how they smell. Does it smell good under there? I can promise you it doesn't. But doesn't our sin stink too? Doesn't our self-righteousness smell like a dung heap? Isn't our filthiness, our our righteousness, the Apostle Paul says, like filthy rags? So who are we to look down on somebody else and not love them because of a chapter, because of a page they're in in their life? Love. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says, love is patient. What does that even mean? What does it even mean that love is patient? I would ask you to go home and look in the mirror and think about all the things that you went through and your daddy still loved you, and your mama still loved you. Love is patient. Love, patient love means that even though you're not doing the right thing, I'm gonna love you. Even though that you're saying the wrong things or hanging out with the wrong people, I'm gonna love you. Love is patient. I can't help but think of how patient God was with me. I ran, and I ran, and I ran. I got saved probably 30 times. Every time my dad had an altar call and the youth down the road, I would run up and I would get saved. I would even fake falling down to make it look authentic. (laughs) Come on, y'all never gave a courtesy fall? (laughs) Really? Am I the only one? (laughs) Some of y'all didn't get it. You will. You'll see it. And you'll know what I'm talking about one day. It happens. It's part of ministry, okay? Okay. Not saying everything is fake, but it just happens. <laughs> and I would run up and I would get saved. And I would want to change, but my desire to be like the world was stronger than my desire to change. But even in that, my God loved me. He loved me. Love is patient. How patient are you with people that are different than you in your life? How patient are you with your family? I 
I fully believe with every fiber in my body the only reason that God has not parted the eastern sky and blown the trumpet and raptured the church out of here is because of his extravagant love for the people that don't know him. I believe it's only by his grace that he hasn't come back to take us. And here we are, being separated and being segregated and fighting over things that don't even matter, fighting over doctrines, fighting over politics, when we can just come together and love and be loved. Love, life is so much better when you're being loved. And not just the love that you give, but the love that you receive from your Father. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not parade itself, it is not puffed up, it does not behave rudely, it doesn't seek its own. And when I read that part of seeking your own, I think about oftentimes when we do things for people in the name of love, the first thing we do is blast it on social media, hey, look at me, look what I did. I gave all this money to these people. Love doesn't seek itself. I would encourage you, when you do things out of love, to do it in secret, to do it in private. Can we pray this morning? Can we pray this morning? Verse 6 says, it does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things. When I look at Jesus in my life, I can see 100%, unequivocally, without a doubt, how love bears all things. How many of you have questioned God's love in your life? How many of you question God's love in your life? And we think sometimes that the things we say and the things we do will make God love us more or love us less. And I can assure you, nothing you've done or said or no lifestyle that you're living will make God not love you. Nothing can separate you. No height, no depth. No power, no principality, nothing can separate you from the love of God, from the agape love of God. And there's so many of us as Christians, we're running around this world phileoing God. He's a friend of mine. He is a friend when I need him. But are we a friend when he needs us? So many of us run around saying, Jesus, I will die for you. And he's saying, I don't want you to die for me. I want you to live for me. I've already died. I want you to live for me. I want you to agape me, sacrifice your life, your desires, your will, your hope, your emotions, everything you are, everything you have, sacrifice to the king of kings. Because one day we're going to stand before him. And he's going to say, did you phileo me or did you agape me? And I choose to agape Jesus. I choose to sacrifice my life, my desires, my hopes, so that I can be closer to him. Because that calling to know him and make him known is so powerful. Can you feel it? Do you agape him? Maybe you don't know any kind of love. Maybe you don't feel love because of the lifestyle or the choices you've made in your life. And I want to tell you this morning, you have an opportunity this morning to ask Jesus Christ to be your Savior. With nobody looking around, if you do not know Jesus as your Savior, and if you're watching online and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you want to experience the agape love, the sacrificial love, that he says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is the gift of God. And he says in John three sixteen that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will never perish, but have everlasting life. 
I'm a whosoever. You're a whosoever. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, just raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. Just raise your hand. Let's pray. Raise your hand. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask you this morning, for those of you that raised your hand, to repeat after me. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, and 10 that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you shall be saved. For with your heart you believe unto righteousness. With your mouth confession is made unto salvation. You don't just confess, you believe. Can we all pray together? Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I know you died on the cross for my sins. You were risen on the third day to give me newness of life. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for welcoming me into your kingdom. I am now a child of God. Can we stand and be dismissed this morning? If you don't remember anything else from this message today, I want you to remember and never forget that you were loved. When you were bad, you were loved. When you were doing everything right, you were loved. When you said things you shouldn't have said, you were loved. When you did things you shouldn't have done, you were loved. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Let's pray. Father, as we leave out of here today, I pray that you will take and allow us to take with you, us, your extravagant love. And remind us every day, Lord, the sacrifice that you made, the agape love that you made for me. Lord, should have been me on the cross. Should have been them on the cross, Lord, but it shouldn't have been you. Salvation for me is free, but it costs you everything. Thank you for your love. Thank you for loving me when nobody else would. And thank you for loving me enough that you died on the cross for my sins so I can have eternal life. Lord, we pray over the food. Bless the food. Bless the hands that made it. And we're so thankful, not only for our family, but your extravagant love. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.